Hello everyone, I'm Alexa and I'll be there as tech support during the tutorial. I want to introduce you to our tutor, Miroslav Tomic. He is a teaching assistant at the Faculty of Technical Sciences, University of Novi Sad, and he will hold the introduction of orchestration ETL processes with Apache Airflow tutorial. Enjoy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so just uh, one more confirmation. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. So I can start. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> once again, I'm Roslav Tomic and I work as a teaching assistant at the University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Technical Sciences. Today, I will present you an uh, introduction to orchestration ETL processes with Apache Airflow. Uh, the idea behind this tutorial is to demonstrate the usage of uh, Apache Airflow. That's the one of the first goals. And uh, we will see how to use it uh, on few examples of ETL processes. So <clears throat> today's agenda is about introduction to our tool. Uh, then uh, introduction about uh, Apache Airflow, then something about Apache Airflow, about architecture, about uh, some concepts. Uh, then I will show you tutorial environment as well as ETL process examples. So I prepared um, one project to demonstrate all of this and um, you can find it, uh, I can see in the webinar chat that uh, support team sent uh, drive uh, Google G Drive folder with uh, my materials that I prepared. There is PDF of presentation and also you can access my code on GitHub. Uh, one of the main prerequisites for this tutorial is uh, <clears throat> Docker. So I will try to follow this chat and also to see here uh, if somebody raised hand, I can see that one attendee has raised hand. So if there are any questions, you can write in chat or you can stop me and ask, please. So do not hesitate. Um, okay. Uh, first, we will go through the presentation. I will go through the presentation and uh, later we will see also the project. So, uh, I don't know what is this book CSV <laughs> that tech supports uh, team sent, but um, you can find uh, all data that is needed for this project on the GitHub re repository. There is a URL, so you can download everything if you want to also uh, get hands on this project during the tutorial. So uh, first of all, Apache Airflow is open source platform for developing, scheduling, and uh, monitoring batch-oriented workflows. So workflows can be built with almost any technology, uh, which is possible because of Airflow extensible Python framework. So state of the workflows are managed with help of a web interface. Uh, and one of the main characteristics of Airflow workflows is that all workflows are defined in Python code. So uh, workflow as a code serves several purposes. First of all, um, it's dynam dynamic. So Airflow pipelines are configured as Python code, uh, allowing for dynamic pipeline generation. It's extensible. So the Airflow framework contains operators, operators to connect with numerous technologies. Uh, all Airflow components are extensible to easily adjust to your environment. And it's also flexible. So workflow parameterization is built in uh, using the SOM templating engine. Okay, so that's just a brief introduction. Also on this slide, you can see one snippet of a code. Uh, we will go into details uh, with project that I prepared, but here you can see just a few things. Of course, at the, at the beginning, there are some uh, imports, and also here we are uh, <clears throat> declaring some DAG. We will see what the DAG is and few tasks that should be executed. Okay, so in order to uh, follow this tutorial, you need to have some basic knowledge about the Python code, about the Docker and uh, SQL. So um, 
I will I will try to uh, go easily with everything, but uh, we need to tackle some details. So uh, first of all, maybe I should ask uh, how many of you knows how to work with Docker? So you can just raise a hand, please. I need to know this because uh, of the, uh, yeah, my explanations and everything else. Okay, okay, don't worry. Then I need to go into details about everything. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So uh, let's first see something about Apache Airflow. Uh, first of all, uh, let's see about installation. So it is possible to perform multiple types of installation. So you can install uh, Apache Airflow as standalone tool. You can use the release sources. You can run it on the local machine. Also, you can use pipe uh, <clears throat> PyP, so uh, you can install it uh, with Python. Uh, you can also use the Docker images. We are in this tutorial, we are using Docker images. Um, you can also use some official Airflow Helm chart and uh, also third party images, charts, deployments, and everything else, but it's not, it is not so recommended to, to use it. Some prerequisites for this uh, is to have Python with these versions that are supported. Also, these databases. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Microsoft SQL database is deprecated. Uh, also, uh, in official documentation, there is no uh, Postgres 16, but uh, I was able to use it. So, uh, yeah, it is obviously possible to use this Postgres. And if you want to use with Kubernetes, these are supported versions for now. Okay, so um, about Apache architecture. So here, uh, workflow is rep represented as a DAG. It's uh, directed a cyclic graph and contains individual pieces of work that's called tasks. Okay, uh, DAG specifies the dependencies between tasks and uh, the order in which to execute them and run retries. Okay, so this uh, installation consists of the following. You have scheduler with executor here, and then you have web server, you have DAG files in the directory, and you have metadata database. Okay, so this scheduler uh, handles both triggering scheduled workflows and submitting tasks. Okay, uh, it's submitting tasks to the workers, to executor actually, to execute them. Uh, executor handles the running tasks. In the default Airflow installation, this runs everything inside the scheduler. Uh, but most production suitable executors actually push task execution out to workers. Uh, also, web server, which contains, uh, which represent a hand user interface to inspect, uh, trigger, and debug the behavior of DAGs and tasks. Okay, we have really nice, nice user interface here. Uh, and also, uh, <clears throat> there is a directory that uh, contains the DAG files. <clears throat> it's read by a scheduler and executor or uh, any workers that ex executor has. Metadata database is used by the scheduler, executor, and the web server to store the data. It's not so complex architecture. Um, let me run this architecture that I prepared for you. I will not explain it now, just to run to see this web interface. So I will also try, I will explain this running of this architecture, but uh, let me just run here just to be able to see the web interface of Apache Airflow. Uh, okay, it's creating some uh, Docker containers now and uh, it's turning on the Apache Airflow. It takes around one or two minutes. We will wait for this to turn on. So if you have any questions, please, uh, you can ask it or you can just write your question in the chat. Okay, I just need to wait for a few more seconds.
Okay. Uh, Apache Airflow works by default on this port, but it's not turned on yet. Okay. Okay, here we are. So uh, the credentials are just Airflow Airflow. And when you sign in, you can see this web interface and we will use this web interface to run our examples. Okay, uh, this is just for you to see. It reminds on some kind of dashboard or something like that. Okay, let's back to uh, our presentation. Um, so in this architecture, you have workloads uh, because DAG runs through a series of tasks. You have also control flow. DAGs are designed to be run many times and multiple runs of them can happen in parallel. So DAGs can be also parameterized. That's one kind of uh, workload. And you have this user interface that you saw on uh, <clears throat> here on my web browser. Uh, let's see what is DAG. DAG or direct acyclic graph is the core concept of Airflow. It's collecting tasks together, organized with dependencies and relationship to say how they should run. You have DAG declaration, you have context manager for that purpose, you have standard constructor or DAG decorator. Uh, on this URL, you can see DAG arguments and I want to open this URL to see the official documentation. So I made these examples in this version of Airflow, it's 2.7.2. So I also put URL with this version, the latest version is 2.7.3. Uh, so this documentation is very good. Apache Airflow has very, very good documentation and you can find all details here in the documentation. Uh, also, I put some references inside the presentation and each slide has a reference to the, to the documentation because it's uh, it has many, many properties, many uh, configuration things. It's not so easy to put everything in slides. So I left this uh, just as URL to get familiar with uh, these concepts. So as you can see on this picture, uh, these are some um, <clears throat> nodes in graph and uh, these nodes represents uh, tasks. So uh, this is, this everything is just deck. So you, as you can see, the first task is A, then in parallel B and C are running, then D is waiting for B and to C to be finished, then the task can be executed. Okay, so this is just briefly about the DAG. You can declare it on many ways. So this is just one example of declaring DAG. You, you specify its name, its uh, ID. You can also specify start date when your DAG should start running and uh, how often should it be uh, run. So you schedule your uh, DAG to be run. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, you can use different kind of uh, instantiation, as I said. Uh, we will use this example with uh, decorator here. Uh, so that's just briefly about the DAX. Uh, so I just want to say the motivation behind this, uh, behind the usage of DAX and the Apache Airflow. So uh, if we have some use cases like uh, transferring data for, from OLTP database to OLAP database. So if you have that kind of databases, you need to create some process that will transform data, that will extract data from the source and load it to the target database. So you need to prepare some kind of uh, code to do that. You can do it with some graphical tools with uh, any programming language, but you need to execute these things to transfer the data. So one uh, of the biggest problem is uh, how we should schedule that uh, running. So uh, you can do it manually. You can just every month run manually all scripts that you have, but that's kind of uh, overhead maybe for developers or for the <laughs> guys that should uh, do that. But you can uh, use the Airflow for that purpose because you can schedule your scripts to be executed. Uh, as I said on the beginning of this presentation, you can you can use any programming language 
almost any programming language. So if you prepare your scripts like in Bash or something like that, you can just schedule the executing of those scripts with DAG, with Apache Airflow, and you just monitor uh, monitor that state of your of execution of the scripts. So uh, that's one thing in about motivation why to use Apache Airflow. Okay. Um, task is a basic unit of execution in Airflow. So tasks are arranged into DAX and they have upstream and downstream dependencies set between them in order to express the order they should run in. So there are three basic kinds of tasks. They are operators, they are sensors, and they are task full decorated tasks. So operators are predefined task templates that you can string together quickly to build most parts of your DAGs. So sensors, that's a special subclass of operators, which are entirely about waiting for an external event to happen. And a task flow is a decorated task, which is a custom Python function packaged up as a task. So uh, I will open now documentation for the task. So here are all the explanation about the tasks. And this is the example of how we uh, run our tasks inside the DAC. So this, all of this is a Python code, but we are just putting this, these tasks in pipeline. So as you can see, we are defining that we should first run first tasks, first task, then second task, then we run in parallel third and fourth task. Okay, we can also use different kind of uh, running these tasks with set the downstream or set upstream methods. So there are different uh, <clears throat> uh, ways to express this. Uh, and uh, here are many things about the tasks. We will use the uh, decorator task flow, decorated task to express our tasks. So one example is right here. So we will define our tag like this. Then later we will just define our task on this way. So as you can see, we are writing Python functions. So uh, we are just decorating these functions to become DAG or to become a task. Okay, so after tasks, uh, there are operators. What is operator? That's conceptually template for a predefined tasks. Uh, you can use it or define it declaratively declaratively inside the DAG. And Airflow has a very extensive set of operators, but the most popular are Bash operator, Python operator, and email operator. So um, now I want to show you one example here. So this is the web interface for the uh, Apache Airflow. You have many DAGs, DAGs here. I prepared four DAGs, but uh, you have also example DAGs here. Uh, let's see some example. It's tutorial example. When I open one task, I get this page where I can enable or disable this tag. Actually, it's pose and unpose tag. You can see many things here, like grid, like graph, like calendar, task duration, task tries, uh, details, and code. Okay. I will just open this code. As you can see here, this is just like Python script. It's This code is written in Python. And at the beginning of this code, we have some imports here. Then we are defining one DAG. We are giving some default arguments here. <clears throat> and um, some of them are commented because we are using default values for that. Uh, there is a large number of uh, these arguments and you can see all of them in documentation. So after we define this DAG, we now need to define the tasks to be run inside this DAG. So one of the tasks is T1, it's bash operator. It has a name or ID, print date, and it will execute bash command date. So this is the predefined task. Okay, it's actually bash operator. So task two, T2, it's also bash operator. It has ID sleep. Uh, it does not depend on any past tasks. And a bash command that will execute is sleep five. It will sleep uh, process for five seconds. 
So uh, how many retries I can have? You can have three retries. Okay. Uh, so you can also write the documentation for your DAG or for your task. This is one way of uh, creating the documentation. I will show this in details in my examples. So uh, <clears throat> you can also prepare some templated command on this way as you can see using the templating engine. And T3, task T3, it's also bash operator that will use this template, okay, this templated command. It does not depend on any past tasks. Okay, so let's see. Uh, first, we will execute the task one, then we are doing task two and task three in parallel. Okay, so uh, I can open here graph, and on this graph, you can also get maybe better overview to see how tasks are execute, executed. So first we are doing this task print date, then in parallel uh, sleep and templated tasks are executing. How should I run this task? I can just press here trigger DAG or I can just unpause this DAG. So let me open the docs. Uh, we don't have any docs for our deck. So when I run, uh, when I trigger this tag, you can see that there are two executions of this deck. Why? Because it is defined to be executed. Okay, when you unpause DAG, it should be executed, but also I triggered another execution. So this trigger actually will unpause tasks, unpause DAG. And this means the DAG will be executed. And also, because I triggered DAG, there is another execution. So here, first execution, I can click on it and I can get some details. Uh, because everything is green, that means that all tasks are executed successfully inside our DAG. You have here on the <clears throat> this sidebar um, each task okay, and its name, and you can see the details by clicking this box here. So when I click print date, I can see the details about the print date. When I go to the code, I see the whole code of our DAG, but when I click on logs, I can see some details about executing this task. Okay, there are some uh, <coughs> log outputs, but but what we are what we were doing in this in this task we are just printing the date so i can see here is the output and actual output that we want is here so it printed uh date here it's uh 20 november today monday okay so this means that task is completed successfully then we had some sleep task we cannot see, see anything, but uh, we cannot see the result of executing uh, <clears throat> except by looking in these time logs. So we were running command bash sleep five. And uh, as you can see, it happens in 46 seconds. And the next log was in 51. This means that five seconds, nothing happened. Okay. And the third task, third task is template task. <coughs> and uh, in the output here, we can see a few dates. What is this? Uh, I should return to the code. This template said, okay, we will uh, iterate. We have five iterations here. We will print the date also, and we will add uh, seven days to today date. So in the logs here, you can see it's uh, this date and this date. Seven days difference between them. This means that task is executed success successfully and the whole DAG is also executed successfully. Okay, so this is just a brief explanation of uh, DAG and tasks, and we saw these operators. We saw a bash operator here. You can also use Python operator. Uh, you can just specify the Python script that should be uh, executed, and that's it. Also, you can use email operator. Uh, when you create a DAG, 
you can specify <coughs> here uh, should we email someone someone on failure and if task if DAG fails then you can the email is sent automatically to this uh, address uh, and also you can use email operator to specify something else, okay? Uh, it's predefined tasks, so you don't have to specify all the things. Okay, so that's about the operators. <clears throat> um, let's see sense about something about sensors. It's a different kind of task. It's a special type of operator that is designed to wait for an event. So it can be time-based or waiting for a file or an external event. So sensors are primarily, primary idle and they have two different modes of running. It's poke and it's reschedule. So poke, that's the default. Uh, the sensor takes up a worker slot for its entire runtime. Uh, reschedule, the sensor takes up a worker slot only when it's checking and sleeps for a set duration between checks. Okay, so the poke and reschedule modes can be configured directly when you instantiate the sensor. Generally, the trade-off between them is latency. So something that is checking every second should be in poke mode and something that is, that is checking every minute should be in reschedule mode. So this is something also from the documentation. Uh, what is task flow? So if code is mostly written using Python instead of operators, uh, task flow API will make it much easier to author clean decks without extra boilerplate or all using the decorated task. Okay, so task flow takes care of moving inputs and outputs between tasks using XCOMS, and we will see what is XCOMS. Um, so uh, if you use something like this, this means that you are using decorated task and this Python code will be executed. Uh, okay, let's get back to presentation. Something about the executors. So executors are the mechanism by which task instances get run. So they have a common API and they are pluggable. This means they can be swapped based on the installation needs. So to check which executor is currently set, you can execute this command. So uh, you are not just executing um, Apache Airflow commands through the web interface. You can also use uh, Apache Airflow CLI. So you have command line interface to execute some Airflow commands. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's see what is XCOMS. XCOMS, that's short for cross communications. That is mechanism that let tasks talk to each other. So by default, tasks are entirely as isolated and may be running on entirely different machines. So an XCOM is identified by key, its name, uh, task ID and DEG ID. So XCOMS can have any uh, value, but they are only designed for small amounts of data. So uh, they shouldn't be used to pass around large values like data frames. Okay, They are explicitly pushed and pulled to or from their storage using the XCOM push or XCOM pull methods on task instances. So you can use XCOMs in templates like this. So if you're selecting something from table, you can uh, get the table name uh, with this uh, task instance, you are just pulling data that task should return. We will see all these things inside the project, inside the examples that I prepared. I just need to um, introduce you to this concept with presentation. So don't worry, you just need to hear something about these concepts. Okay, uh, variables. Um, that's the airflow runtime configuration concept. That's a general key value store that is global and can be queried from tasks. Uh, they can be easily set with airflows, user interface, or bulk loaded as a JSON file. So they can be used in code by importing variable model and calling get on it, get method on it. Uh, also, they can be used in templates. 
So variables are global and they shouldn't be used to pass the data between tasks. They should be used only for configuration that covers the entire installation. So according to the airflow document documentation, it is recommended to keep the most of setting and configuration in DAG files so it can be versioned using the source control. Uh, so variables are only for values that are truly runtime dependent. Okay, that's some really global configuration. Uh, also, because we are writing uh, our uh, DAGs, our tasks, our scripts uh, inside of Python code, we can use any source control tool. So you can use just Git and you have source control. So that's one of the advantages of this airflow. Uh, something about parameters. Parameters are used to provide runtime configuration to tasks. So default parameters can be configured in that code and also additional parameters can be added. So it is possible to overwrite parameters values at runtime when DAG is triggered. So parameters are validated using JSON schema that should be provided. And for scheduled DAG runs, default parameters values are used. Okay, so that's everything about some um, basic uh, Apache Airflow concepts. Uh, I uh, really hope that you, that you understand this uh, and to have idea uh, about how we uh, create one day, what is task, what kind of tasks we have. And now we will see uh, the environment that I prepared here. So uh, Docker is used to re uh, simulate the real scenario. So uh, maybe you have a few local machines that should be executors, or uh, maybe your database is in cloud, maybe your target database on different server. So in order to sim simulate the real scenario, I prepared the Docker. Each container represents uh, something. I have first uh, container for Apache Airflow. It's used as orchestrator tool. It contains the Docker configuration, Airflow configuration, and DAX. Uh, I use this MS SQL container as a source database. Uh, it also contains some Docker configuration, database backups, and script for restoring backup. So I prepare this container as a source database. I put some example data inside this database. This is Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, also, I prepared uh, Postgres uh, that is used as a target database, this container. In this uh, directory, you have also Docker configuration, script for the creation of initial schemas and tables. So what I want to simulate here, uh, I want to simulate uh, the um, <clears throat> scenario where we are mapping uh, data from OLTP database to the post to the OLAP database. So if you have some transaction processing database, you have a uh, <clears throat> large amount of data, but uh, at some point time, your company wants to create data warehouse system and it will use this different kind of database for that. Uh, and also we need to create different schema because uh, data warehouse schema is completely different than the transaction. And uh, what we need to do, we need to extract the data from the source database, from the Microsoft SQL database. In this case, uh, we need to transform that data uh, and also to load this, this data inside the target database, inside the Postgre database. Okay, so uh, let's see concretely this project. Uh, I will zoom in. I hope that everything is visible. So I'm using here, um, my operating system is Linux and I installed this uh, Visual Studio code here. And this is project that you have access to it. And as you can see, uh, there are few, <clears throat> Few directories here. Uh, where should I start? Maybe I should start with source database. So this directory contains a Docker Compose file in uh, which I prepared uh, <coughs> this container. So um, I created some external network in order that all our containers uh, 
um, be part of the same network. So for the one who doesn't know about the Docker, uh, that's a virtualization technology uh, that helps us to create uh, one isolated environment for running our code. It's really, really used in uh, development, uh, also somewhere in production. Uh, but I can have a really separate uh, processes running inside of each container. So my first container is this one. I created <laughs> uh, uh, Microsoft. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> I created uh, some container uh, with this name from this image. So uh, every container is created from some image that is already prepared or that we can create by ourselves. Uh, in this case, I use this uh, official image from the Microsoft Docker Hub. Uh, I used the uh, 2017 version of Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, I expose this port. So when you create uh, some container and you run process inside of it, uh, in order to be able to access this uh, from outside of container, you need to do the port mapping like this one here. So I can access this container by typing the IP address on localhost <coughs> dots this port. Uh, in order to configure SQL Server, we need to uh, provide some environment variables here. Um, everything of this is um, uh, written in uh, official documentation. So I'm just uh, passing the default system admin password. Also, I'm uh, passing the port where this database should be run. Okay, uh, I don't want to explain these things uh, so much, but uh, what we need to have, we need to have volumes. This is something uh, specific for the Docker. Uh, if you want to have a uh, persistence of the, of your data, even after uh, turning off your container, you need to create volume so you can store your data. And when you again run your container, it can read th this data for the for from these volumes. So there are two different kinds of volume. You have uh, bind mounts. You can just bind your volume to the some directory at your local system. Here in my project, I have config directory and I <clears throat> pass this configuration uh, with this directory. So I mapped the directory config inside of the Docker container on my local config directory. And I will have all uh, files inside this directory also in Docker container. Uh, the second thing are backups. I also uh, <clears throat> directly mapped my local directory to this directory inside the Docker container. And the third volume uh, is not bind mount. It's really Docker volume that is created. Uh, that's some specific kind of storage for the Docker. Docker's, Docker manage uh, these storages. And I mapped uh, this uh, volume to this directory. So uh, this is the Microsoft SQL Server directory for storing the data files. So if I insert something in database inside the Docker container, if I want to keep this data between the rest restarts or of my container, uh, I should do this mapping. I should create this volume and map to this directory and um, then I'm done with uh, saving my data. Uh, if you're using different kind of database, you should read in documentation of which directory should be mapped or directories. Uh, also here, I specify the network that this container should be used, uh, should use. And uh, with this, I'm specifying to create this uh, with this uh, Docker Compose file. So this is just briefly about the uh, Docker Compose for source database. So here I prepared two backups. Uh, this is some Microsoft uh, SQL example that is created for the purpose of uh, experimenting with uh, OLTP and OLAP database uh, for uh, creating data warehouse actually. 
and it's created, I think, 15 years ago, but uh, it's used even now to run some examples with Azure with cloud. So uh, that's on the official Microsoft. Uh, there is officially a Microsoft GitHub repo with this, but also you can find it on the Microsoft in Microsoft documentation. Uh, it's important to download 2017 backup because we are using that SQL server. You will see that there are, I can open also this link. You can see here that you have 2022, 2019, uh, etc. So there are uh, multiple backups. So uh, I said I want to simulate um, extracting data from the OLTP database to the OLAP database. Uh, but I don't want to use the same database for the data warehouse. Uh, this is the reason why I prepared this Postgres, but uh, why should we download this data warehouse backup? Because I want uh, to see the schema that they prepared. Uh, focus of this tutorial is not on creating the data warehouse or following the exact concept of it. So we will see how they implement the data warehouse. We will use uh, just, we will use their schema just for an ID for an idea how to create our own. Okay, uh, also uh, the last thing is this configuration. This is the bash script that will be run inside the container. This script uh, will just uh, uh, perform the restore of OLTP database and OLAP database from these backups. So as you can see, this is some uh, specific code, but uh, we are actually accessing our backups from, from uh, inside of Docker container. So we mapped our local directory and transferred uh, our backup files here so we can access it from inside of container. Okay, so this script will be executed after this Docker container is turned on. Okay, so this is the source database. I really hope that you understand uh, what I created here and uh, for what purpose we are using this database. So the next uh, configuration here is for Postgre database. This database is used in our example as a target database. It will be actually like data warehouse database. Uh, and we, <coughs> we, are, we also need to create this container. It's pretty much the same as in the case of Microsoft SQL database. Here we are using the latest Postgres version. We have some environment variables that are defining which user uh, will be created with which password, password and also which database to create. Uh, we are exposing this port. As you can see inside the container, this is the default Postgre port, but since uh, Airflow is also using Postgre for um, for its own uh, meta store, uh, we need to expose different port here. So I'm just exposing uh, 5433 port. Uh, I'm also mapped config directory, and I also mapped some uh, specific volume to uh, keep my data that I will insert inside the database between the container restart. Uh, this is some health check configuration you can see here. Also, I'm uh, specifying that this container should use this airflow network that I will create as step separate step. Okay, so this is just external network here, but all my containers will be in the same network because they need to talk with each other. So. Um, that's it for the Postgre configuration. Here inside the configuration directory in Postgre, we have set up SQL script. We will create one schema that is called row schema and we will create data warehouse schema. So the row schema is used for um, ELT processes actually. Uh, you have some row zone uh, where you will put your data that you read from all TV. OLTP database or any different kind of sources. So uh, I will leave just this row schema if you want to experiment with something. It's default, it's created by default here. 
Uh, and also I created this data warehouse schema uh, just to uh, use for this tutorial. We will specify some, uh, we'll create some tables inside that schema. We'll, we will create just one um, <clears throat> dimension table. It's called currency. We will see that in the source database. And also we will create one fact table that is called currency rate. I will not explain these tables now, uh, but also almost the same as in the case of um, SQL Server. This bear script will be ran when you uh, turn on when we turn on our container. Uh, so um, it will create these schemas for our user that we defined, and it will create these tables inside the data warehouse schema. So that's the configuration of the Postgre. And the last uh, configuration is for Airflow. So what I have done here. So this Docker Compose is, is really large and I use the official Docker Compose from the uh, Apache Airflow GitHub repository. On that repository, you can find this example docker compose file and you can just modify uh, this file to suit your needs as they already said here so i did exactly that uh, i also specified here that i have network that is created external it's airflow network and here i don't want to use default image so um default apache airflow image uh you can specify it, uh, you can use it, but if you want to customize, to install some other software on that image, then you should build your image by yourself. So in Docker Compose file, if you specified uh, this build instead of image and put just dot, this means that uh, it's expected to find in the same directory Docker file. This Docker file, uh, <coughs> will specify how to build image. And later in the Docker Compose, this image will be used to uh, create, to run Docker container on it. So uh, I defined here first layer, I will use default, uh, I mean, official uh, Apache Airflow image with this Python version. Uh, also, I will copy my requirement txt uh, what is this? If you have something uh, specific that you need in Python code, for instance, I will need some uh, Microsoft uh, SQL drivers or Postgres drivers. Or in this case, I want to use it from the Apache Airflow providers. I need to install it. So it's not default installed. Uh, also, for instance, if you are using some other uh, tools, if you are using, for instance, Apache Spark or something like that, and you want to be executed inside of uh, Airflow container to use the scheduler to, in, to execute that process, you will need to install Spark as a unit inside this container. So you can do it here. You can do it inside of the Docker file, uh, but also you can specify some bash script, okay? Uh, to run apt-get install command to install Spark or anything that you need. Okay, so uh, this is the reason why I uh, decided to create a Docker file and this requirements txt just for you to see how you can customize this Apache Airflow image. Uh, what is required also? It's required uh, to have DAX directory uh because in this docker compose you will see that we are mapping also some volumes you need to create dax uh because uh all or all, all our code that we are typing uh, we are typing and saving in python files here inside the dag directory and it will be uh, also automatically inside of the Airflow container and Airflow will be able to see that there are some changes inside the directory. It will load your DAG and it will be shown inside of a uh, web interface. So you can run that DAG. Um, I had some issues. I specified only this directory DAG 
DAX, but I have some issues uh, because uh, there are some things to be logged uh, to uh, inside of Apache Airflow. And if you don't create uh, these directories, logs, plugins, uh, and config, uh, then um, you will have some issues like uh, problems with permissions or something like that. It's expected to, uh, if you ever uh, type any mapping here in volumes, it's expected to find this directory here. Uh, also, uh, I already specified some configuration inside this directory. Uh, I really now can't remember if uh, I created this line or it's uh, also default line inside of uh, this Docker Compose, but I need this configuration. I also need uh, some uh, bash script to be executed after we run the Apache Airflow. Okay, so uh, this is some uh, kind of configuration here, but actually our containers are here. So I specified a uh, Postgre database. I mean, uh, they also they provided this code. I just changed the version. I put 16 here. So we need to have this instance of database of Postgre to use it as a meta database inside, uh, inside our uh, <clears throat> Apache Airflow container. So if I return to our slide to see this architecture, this is a metadata database here. Okay, let's return to here. So it uses Redis uh, to store some something uh, for scheduling. Okay, so this is a NoSQL database. And here is a, a Airflow web server. So as you can see, it will run on this port 8080. Uh, so uh, this is a configuration of that container. Uh, here you can see Airflow scheduler. Okay, so web server is this. Uh, this is the scheduler. It's also It also has some configuration here. For the Airflow worker, we are creating uh, one container, okay, separate co container. And uh, uh, this container will be used for uh, delegating, uh, for executing our DAX. Uh, you have also this trigger uh, to trigger our tasks. You have some init container that will be uh, used only for some configuration uh, when you just when you run this docker compose file uh, it will be only executed for like for one minute and this container will be uh, turned off after everything here is executed i really i really <clears throat> don't know uh, what everything here means but this is some configuration for apache airflow uh, it's something about uh, resources that will be used by Airflow. Okay. Um, so here is also one Airflow CLI uh, container that we can use. And um, that's it pretty much uh, for Apache Airflow Docker Compose file. Here in setup object bash script, I'm specifying specifying something to be <coughs> executed inside uh, Airflow. I want uh, for my Apache Airflow container to be aware of uh, my databases. So I'm specifying connection parameters configuration to this Microsoft SQL database. Also, I'm specifying uh, connection parameters for our Postgres data warehouse database. Let's call it like that. And uh, here I have um, Airflow database connection parameters. I will also need them. We will see why. And I'm setting up some variables. Okay, uh, you heard for the concepts of variables. I can also define variables inside of a web interface, through the web interface. I can also specify these connections uh, with uh, web interface, but I can also do it from the CLI. Uh, so um, I 
this, uh, this configuration, I write this configuration here, uh, just for you to have, uh, to see that you can also create on this way. So I think it's much easier to do it with command line. So uh, all these lines will be executed as a bash script inside the uh, Airflow container uh, after it's turned on. Uh, my variable that will be used is called as as SQL chunk size, and its value is twenty. So we will see later what this means. Uh, my DAGs are written here. We will go one by one later. Uh, just to finish the explanation of this uh, environment, you have directory scripts. Here you have script uh, cluster up. What is this script? In this script, I'm creating this network in, inside the Docker, and I'm putting all my containers inside of this network. So first of all, I want to start uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So I'm doing this uh, on this way. Uh, I'm typing Docker Compose, and I'm specifying Docker Compose file for the Microsoft SQL database. I'm telling it to, <clears throat> I'm specifying the parameter up to run the Docker Compose and I'm detaching this. So I i don't want to wait until everything is ready to go to the next line, but I will just make small pauses between uh, running these things just for the five seconds. After I start this source database, I will start Airflow container and after the Airflow container, I will start the target database container. Okay, then I will go into sleep for 15 seconds. Just uh, to be, uh, just to these containers be ready for uh, <clears throat> some configuration. After they are ready, I will do uh, some configuration of individual services. First of all, I want to run these backups inside the source database. So I'm preparing this command bash uh, to execute this bash script. And I uh, want to uh, uh, jump into the Docker container and just execute this command. My Docker container here is SQL Server and it will execute this command. Uh, okay. <clears throat> then later, I'm also doing the same for the uh, Apache Airflow. As you can see, I'm jumping into the web server container and I'm running this uh, Airflow uh, CLI commands. Uh, that is written inside the script setup airflow objects. And the third service that I will configure is this uh, <clears throat> target database. I will uh, execute this command just to create uh, some uh, schemas and tables that I specified inside the SQL file that we saw. And after these commands are sex successfully executed, our cluster is ready for the use. So how you run this? You, if you are inside the root of our directory, if you are positioned inside of it, you are just typing dot slash scripts, that is the, the directory that contains our bash scripts, and cluster up <clears throat> bash script, and you just press enter. Uh, if you are on Linux, you, I, I think that you will not have any issues. But if you are running this from the uh, Windows, uh, if you are if you are inside of Git Bash, maybe you will not have any issues. But from PowerShell, probably. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, you should be aware uh, of line endings, and I put some uh, commands here. If uh, you have issues like you have problems with line feed, with carriage return line feed or line feed, you just need to run these two commands. Okay, it will it will also sh it should be run from uh, the root of our project just to fix your line endings inside of the project, and then you can execute the script. I already executed this script. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not doing it now. Uh, because I uh, executed this script before this tutorial, my Docker containers, Docker images are downloaded 
and also image for airflow is built up. So it will just take like two minutes to uh, uh, <clears throat> um, have cluster ready. But in your case, uh, some dependencies, some images will be downloaded for some time, like for, it depends on the, of your internet network. Um, okay, you have this cluster down script. Uh, what is this? We need to shut down these containers. So I only created uh, <clears throat> here one question, yeah. Do you want to delete all volumes? So if you have done something, and you don't want to lose your data, uh, but you need to turn on your containers. You just said, okay, no, I don't want to, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to uh, delete my volumes, but if you want to start from the beginning to have clean uh, installation, let's call it like this, then to have clean cluster, yeah, uh, you just need to uh, type yes after you uh, turn on everything. Okay, maybe I can uh, run the script down. I will say, say yes, I want to um, delete my volumes. So now it will uh, it will delete my Docker containers. It will delete volumes and also it will delete this network. So I don't have anything that is running now. So if I type, docker ps command i don't have any container that is running if i type ps to see all my containers i will see that i only have some other containers that i am using on my pc but i don't have any of these container uh, that is turned off so my containers actually are deleted after this uh after executing this script Okay, the third command that we can see is Docker images. And here I can see that I already have uh, images in my repository. As you can see, Airflow worker images uh, will use this much, this amount of storage. Uh, Airflow init container also, uh, scheduler, trigger, web server. Also, uh, there is Redis container, Postgre 16, and Microsoft as a source database. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. You have eight um, Docker images. It will take some time to download uh, Redis, Postgres, and Microsoft SQL Server, and also some time to build these images. Um, I think that uh, this is all about uh, tutorial environment. So do you have any questions for now? For now, I will just turn on my cluster again. So this is some tip, uh, I don't know if it's typical, but some architecture in your project that you can use. So you specified something for your uh, source database, for your target database, you can, uh, use your airflow to be inside the container. So uh, you never develop anything on the production data. So you back up your database as a source database and use this backup as I used here. And you experiment, create some ETL processes, create some code. Uh, test it and then you can deploy your airflow code and just switch connections not to be for your local database for your development but to be for the production database okay any questions Also, I'm very sorry for my English today. It's, uh, I, I don't know what's happening, <laughs> but it's not so um, good today. So I hope really that you can understand me. Uh, if you have any, any questions, please uh, write in, in chat or uh, ask here directly.
I will explain everything from the beginning or if you need any additional explanation also. Uh, okay. If there are no questions, I should continue. Now uh, I will go to my slide examples. I will close everything else. <laughs> So now uh, we will demonstrate usage of this Apache Airflow to create and orchestrate ETL processes. Uh, as I said, I prepared uh, these backups and uh, you will not find, when you download my project, you will not find it uh, because uh, it uses around, I don't know, 400 megabytes. So uh, I ignored those files inside the project with git ignore. So you should download these backups and put inside this directory. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I want I want to see to explain this data a little bit. So uh, here I'm using dbeaver as my uh, to, to visualize the database, to see all the tables data. So this is my uh, this is my source database. I will call it source now. That's Microsoft SQL database. And here I created connection. So it will be run on localhost on this port. Uh, I will use this database. And here uh, I'm authenticating with this user that I create in Docker Compose. So here inside the Docker Compose, you have uh, your password. So the default user is SA. And when you type everything, uh, you can just press OK and connect. So uh, maybe you are not using DBeaver. Uh, maybe you're using uh, how it's called uh, data grip in JetBrains, uh, or maybe you're using something else to visualize your database. You don't need this for uh, running our examples. Uh, this is just for me to demonstrate, but of course it's much better to have this to visualize the data. So after I connect to my source database and I expand these databases, I will see that I have this uh, OLTP database, AdventureWorks 2017, and I have this database, AdventureWorks uh, Data Warehouse to. 2017. Uh, <clears throat> let's see this adventure works 2017, this OLTP database. After I ex uh, expand this, I have different schemas. And here uh, I'm interested in this sales schema. Here are some tables. As you can see, uh, there is a really, really um, large number of tables. Uh, it's something about sales, products, uh, human resources in one company and other things. So <clears throat> after I uh, click on this database, I can see on this table, sorry, I can see its data. Okay, so uh, I'm interested in this table currency and currency rate. I will use these two tables as source tables, and I want to extract those data to do some transformation and to load this data inside of uh, data warehouse. So here, if I uh, uh, click on sales schema, I can see some properties. I can see all tables that uh, it uh, has. Also, there are some description because this is these examples are very good. Uh, and uh, you can see in currency, there are uh, <clears throat> currency and currency rate table with this much uh, um, bytes in total. Okay, uh, I can see ER diagram here. And this is diagram for uh, my database for this schema sales. Okay, and if I find currency here, I can see that currency has its name, modified date, that is used almost in every table here, um, but it's connected to currency, to country, region currency, okay? And currency rate also uh, needs to know for which currency we have rate stored, okay? Uh, so if I go inside the currency table, 
I will see this is the currency code and this is the currency name. Okay, the currency code and the currency name. Uh, if I open properties, I can see that um, primary key here is currency code. Okay, so you have these like uh, American US dollar or uh, uh, it's around 105 uh, currencies here inside of this table. Okay, inside the currency rate, uh, you can see um, the currency rate date and from currency to which currency we are showing the rate. There is average rate column. Okay, and end of the end of the rate. Okay, so uh, this is some data that is not so uh, semantically rich, but um, I don't want to create some um, complex uh, examples here. I want you to understand just this data and to see how uh, to use Apache Airflow to transfer this data. Okay, I really hope that you understand. Uh, I'm not giving any big context here. Let's say this is just the data from some company and it stores some currencies. Uh, some pro products are both with uh, some, yeah, uh, there are some payments inside the company and there are different kinds of currencies that are used to pay products. Also, there are different, different currency rates. Our company is inside of the US and we need to, yeah, to create some uh, exchange between two currencies. Okay, so we need to know currency rate. And this is the uh, OLTP database. We have transactions data here. So um, every day in every hour and every minute, this database is updated. So some data are inserted inside of it etc. So we need just these two tables from this example. Uh, you have, I'm leaving you the whole uh, database for you to uh, practice the usage of, of Apache Airflow. Okay, uh, let's see what is inside of the Postgre database. This is our target database. So if I open schemas here, I can see the, there is data warehouse schema and row schema. Row schema is left for you if you want to create some tables inside of it, uh, some temporary tables or to create uh, some row zone. And in this zone, you will transfer your data inside the data warehouse zone. Maybe some uh, mappings are not so trivial. And first, you need to gather all data inside the row schema. And later, you will perform some uh, uh, joins uh, some transformation and you will then load this data inside the data warehouse scheme okay so inside the data warehouse schema uh, i created two tables okay let's open data warehouse schema so uh, this is just one part of a uh, data warehouse database uh, in the data warehouse uh, database we have some tables that are called dimension <coughs> I am very sorry. <clears throat> that are core that are called dimension tables, and you have some fact tables. Fact tables. Uh, we want to track uh, our currency rate uh, by which dimension to see only for some currencies. Let's say like this. Uh, I'm also missing here maybe time dimension, uh, but I also didn't want to make some big examples. Uh, if I open data warehouse database inside of our source database, you will see that you have really, really huge uh, data warehouse system. Here you have many tables, and this is the typical data warehouse schema. You can also get idea how to build data warehouse with this example. I hope it will be usable for you. And you will notice many differences between the OLTP database and OLAP database. So OLTP database is normalized. And here we have the normalization of the database. OK, so I just used from the original data warehouse database, I used these two tables. I just used this fact table and this dimension table. I didn't use here, uh, I have 
dimension tab table. I didn't use that. Uh, I only used here uh, dimension currency and fact currency rate. Okay, and I want to load data from the source inside of these two tables, but in my Postgre database. Uh, what should I do uh, in if I don't use Apache Airflow? Uh, I would maybe create some, again, Python script, or I will use some um, uh, GUI tools like um, Oracle Data Integrator or something like that. Uh, I will connect it, or I will use Apache Nephi, something like that, and I will connect to my source database, create some map mappings, and I will load that data inside the target database. If I'm using Apache Nephi, I can do it with diagrams, with some, um, uh, uh, oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, with diagrams to express mappings on that way transformations on that way, or I can use it with Python code to uh, express my transformations with code. Okay, then I need to run that. I can run manually. I can run my script from the terminal. I can run directly from maybe Apache Nephi or something like that. And that's fine if I need to run that script only once. That's not a big deal. But if I need to do that weekly or monthly or every day, that's kind of overhead maybe. I will create, I don't know, 20 scripts, 30 scripts. Um, it, it can be hard to, um, yeah, to schedule the execution of those scripts. So if I al already created script and I just want to schedule them, I can use Apache Airflow to just uh, schedule the execution of them. And that's not a problem, but I can also use other, uh, uh, other capabilities of Apache Airflow uh, to create my mappings, my transformations. So now I will open Apache Airflow. Uh, just one confirmation. Can you hear me well? And can you can you see my screen still? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I prepared this hello world example. I will unpause this deck. I will get into this code. Uh, it's almost the same thing as um, we already saw, but uh, on this way, I will create my diagrams. Uh, just to remind you, this is the DAG. This is Python function. It represents a DAG. I will use declarative way uh, to express, to configure DAG. Uh, it will have, it will have this name. Uh, description will be like this. Uh, start date will be this one and schedule interval is monthly and we have max active runs one. Okay, inside our DAG, this is the documentation of our DAG and you can visualize here. So you can, as you type code, you can create your documentation. Also on the level of the task, I don't have any special, spe special configuration for this task. So, and this is the hello world. It will just print hello world this is the Python, plain Python. It's not uh, Bash. So I also created documentation for this task. Then I have other task. It's called from DSC. It's also Python, Python function. It has its own documentation. It will print message hello world from DSC Europe uh, 2023. And uh, if I want to execute this, uh, as you can see, uh, I prepared two way of execution. It's hello world. Uh, and from DSC to be run in parallel. As you can see, you are just calling function to be executed all, or I can make it sequentially. So that first we need to run hello world, then later we need to run from DSC. So I unpause this doc, but uh, I will need to refresh this page. So I will just get back, but this DAG is not uh, executed yet I need to trigger it. 
okay <coughs> as you can see everything is executed success successfully uh, if i see this graph i see that uh, we are doing it sequentially and in these logs i can see that hello world is printed and hello world from dsc is printed here you have gantt diagram to see a uh, time as you can see the first task started its execution here, but it's completed here. The other task started even before, but it uh, waited for first task. Uh, I'm sorry, the other task started uh, its execution after task one is finished, uh, and it can be seen here. Okay, so if I want to change anything, because I created such environment, I'm going inside of these DAGs, this is hello world example. And I will uncomment this line and comment this because I want to run these tasks in parallel. This task can be run in parallel. So it's also important if you have anything that can be run in parallel, do it. So uh, now when I save my code like this, I can refresh page. Maybe I can just go to DAX and here inside of DSC, hello world. And if I open code now, I can see that my new code is loaded successfully. So I will get back inside the grid and press trigger DAG. And here on this graph, you can see that these tasks are parallel now. It's not sequentially like before. Time of execution is of course uh, less than previous. And again, we have the same logs. We have the same logs uh here uh okay uh if i open details of my task i can see also documentation when i open more details uh i can see the documentation of tasks somewhere here so 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 hello world task tasks task docs are written here uh so yeah that's just again uh example for you to run to see it, I can pause this. Uh, yeah, one one important thing maybe here you can see the calendar of execution. So I said monthly, it will execute on every first day of each month. Okay, so it's planned to be executed again on Friday, first <clears throat> of December. Okay, let's get back inside the Dex. So my first example uh, is DAG DSC load currency. Um, we will demonstrate the initial feeling of dimension table in all of database. The second example is called DSC load currency sensor. We will use a sensor from Apache Airflow to, de to detect changes changes inside the source database, inside the source table currency. And if any new uh, row will be added, then we will um, also transfer this row inside of uh, our data warehouse database. We don't have to do it manually. Uh, if And our third example is DAG that is called DSC load currency rate. Uh, we will fill the fact table in all of database and we will see some usage of parameters and variables in airflow. Okay, so the purpose of example is of, uh, to discuss about Apache airflow code, concepts, role in this process and other possibilities. Okay, let's start with first one. It's currency, load currency. So here, I need to unzoom to see everything. I do some uh, uh, imports here. I need this uh, Microsoft SQL hook and Postgres hook to be able to connect to our database. So I didn't show you inside of the web interface here. In admin, I can open connections and I can see my connections that I prepared through the command line. If you remember in our bash script, I defined these connections with these names, with these IDs. Also, I prepared one variable, it's called SQL chunk size, and it, it has value 20. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm going back. 
So I'm creating DAG that is called like this with this description. Uh, start date is 1st of November, 2023. It will schedule once, okay? Only once and that's it. Uh, so it's not rescheduled tasks. So we are filling uh, initially our data warehouse dimension table only once. So this is the initial loading of the data. And um, here, uh, our main method is DAG function, OK? And this is the documentation for this DAG. Inside of this DAG, we have only one task. It's it's called load currencies. There are uh, no any special configuration of this task. We are just uh, creating connection to the SQL server. And with this uh, query, uh, we want to uh, load data from sales table currency. I'm uh, reading currency code and name. Okay. So uh, what is important here? I created aliases. So I have a alias for my column. Why? Because this is exactly the same name of the column in our target database. So if I open inside Postgre, inside the target database, I created a data warehouse schema, dimension currency. Uh, ID uh, is uh, auto increment column, that's the primary key. I have currency code, it's variable character, so three, it should be unique. And I have currency name, it's variable character of 15. And uh, as you can see here inside my uh, example, I load this data and I'm putting this data inside the pandas data frame. So uh, we have pandas library inside Airflow. Uh, <clears throat> and we are using that library to transform data, to store data. Uh, maybe you are already familiar with this library. It's uh, pretty popular in Python if you are using Python as a language. Okay, after I read the data from the source database, I want to load it inside the target. Uh, this is just logger to log some uh, information. I want to see number of rows inside uh, <clears throat> this table uh, to see number of uh, rows from the data that I selected. Yeah, so I also want to print data to see. This is just for the purpose of learning. Of course, in your production code, you will not have these prints but uh, logging information, maybe it's important for you. So I'm now creating connection to the Postgres database, to the target database. And what I'm doing, I'm just, I have two SQL uh, methods on this data frame and I can specify the name of the table, specify the engine that will do the transformation uh, inside which schema in this database. And if already uh, exists this table, I will just append with rows that I have from this uh, data frame. Because if my table does not exist, it will create a new table from this uh, data frame. And also, uh, Pandas data frame has default column that is called index. And I don't want to save uh, any index in my database. <clears throat> okay, I don't have that column. <clears throat> So uh, on this way, I'm just running one task inside of my DAG and I'm uh, also calling my DAG yeah, here. So uh, I will just unpause this DAG and I will refresh this page because this DAG will run. I don't have to trigger it. As you can see, here is the documentation of this DAG. And I, if I click here, you can see that status is success. We successfully finished this tag. Uh, also, our code is the same as I open in Visual Studio Code. And inside of these logs, I can find, for instance, um, uh, where I um, where I where I uh, printed number of rows here. I have one hundred and five rows. You already saw it from the source database. Uh, also, I wanted to print my uh, data frame and I have done it this way. I just print the column names. So as you can see, here is currency code and currency name. And of course, there is always default column index inside the pandas data frame. 
Uh, after I go inside uh, of uh, <clears throat> the Beaver here and inside of my Postgre database, I can open dimension table currency. And if I open data, I can see that I have loaded my data inside this table. Okay, so this is the source table inside Microsoft SQL database. And this is the table <clears throat> from the target database. As you can see, we have this auto increment primary key. Uh, we transferred successfully currency code and currency name. So that's it. We finished with initial loading of uh, data warehouse dimension. So what if uh, we don't want uh, to run again this code? What if we want just to refresh our dimension to append with new data? It, this means that we need to type completely new code, okay? And to press <clears throat> to run it, to fill it yeah, with some new data. So uh, what I have done here in Apache Airflow in uh, my other example, <clears throat> it's called load currency sensor. I have not only created this script to fill, uh, <clears throat> with, to append with new data, but I also created something, some special task that is called SQL sensor. I will wait for the new record to appear inside of source table. And if there is no new records, nothing happens. My code will not be executed. I will just check for every 30 seconds if there are new rows. And when the new row appears, then this row will be uh, <clears throat> inserted inside of the target database. So uh, what's important here? <clears throat> I will create one task that is called get currencies count that will return how much rows I have inside of uh, data warehouse table currency. Okay, so <clears throat> I need this information. Uh, maybe it's not so, this example, maybe it's not so uh, very well in line with uh, data, data warehouse concepts and those things. So uh, what will, will I do? I will count my number of records in that data warehouse table. Then this sensor will check every 30 seconds uh, if a uh, number of records inside the source database is increased. Okay, so I need to compare these two numbers. Okay, if the difference between these two numbers is zero, then nothing should happen. There are no any new currency uh, here. I supposed uh, that uh, there will be no deleting of currencies inside the source table. So we are only adding new currency in source table. Then this code is valid. Of course, we don't want to delete anything from the data warehouse. So if anything new appears, this means that it should be loaded inside the data warehouse. Uh, so here, I'm just creating this task, get currency count then I'm creating this SQL sensor. It's predefined operator or task, yeah. Uh, it name is wait for new currency records. Uh, it should connect to SQL server. It should execute this SQL code, okay? And this SQL code is prepared here. Inside the DEX, we have a directory SQL. And what does this uh, SQL code does? <laughs> okay. Definitely, my English is not so good today. Okay, uh, so here I'm just counting uh, uh, records from the sales currency table uh, and I'm dividing it by uh, all records inside the data warehouse table currency, dimension table currency. So how should I get this information? So I'm using XCOM now. now. So I'm using XCOMs. Uh, I want to pull the data that this task will return. Okay, and I want to use this return value inside my uh, select. So I want to count all data from this table and to not to divide to find the difference between this uh, number of these records, yeah, and uh, from something that. Uh, that uh, 
my x con will return. Actually, my task get currencies count will return. Okay, that's it. So if the difference is zero, then nothing should happen. If difference is uh, larger than zero, then we should add new rows. And uh, I prepared this task load new row into dimension rows into dimension table. Uh, and I'm I don't want to get into the de details because of time here. Um, I just um, I'm just fetching um, all rows for from dimension table, and uh, I don't want again to select these rows from the SQL Server. Okay, I'm just finding for the new rows, and after I find them with this query, I just have to save these new rows inside the Postgre table. This task is to delete XCOM's data. Okay, we need to do that because if we are often uh, executing the same DAG, okay, uh, this data about XCOMs, because XCOM serves for exchanging data between tasks, okay will be preserved in the Metastore, we need to delete this data. So uh, after uh, I create this task, I create also one task that is called trigger next run. And I want to, again, trigger the next run of this same deck. And I'm specifying the name of this deck. And also here are the other way to create uh, documentation for these predefined tasks, okay? And I need uh, at the end, uh, as the last line of this deck, is to uh, pipeline these uh, tasks. So I'm writing get currencies count, then I'm waiting for the new records. Uh, if you can see, I'm not putting these uh, parentheses here because this is the predefined type task. Okay, this is the SQL sensor. Uh, these are mine tasks so um i'm counting these currencies this is the first type to be task to be executed then i'm waiting for the new currency records after there are new currency records i want to load this in so into the dimension table then uh, i will delete this xcom data that i used uh inside here okay I want to delete this data and I will trigger the next round of the same deck. Then I'm going from the beginning. Okay, so that's pretty much everything here. So let's run our deck. I'm just unposing it. And as you can see, get currencies count is completed successfully. Okay. And the uh, number of record is 105. That's the true. So this task now, it's this color is blue. It's waiting for the new records to appear. There are no new records. Okay, it will wait, wait, wait. There are no new records. What should I do now? Now I'm going inside the source table. I'm going to add one currency. Okay, this, this is just one new row. Or maybe I can add, ah, never mind, just one. I will save it. Okay, now the new row appeared. Okay, I will wait now to see if my task will de detect this change and if it will load this row inside the uh, dimension table in data warehouse. Uh, so as you can see how to refresh is turned on, something is not working very good, but uh, okay, as you can see, it detected a new row. So here, I loaded a new row inside of dimension table. I deleted this data from XCOM. I triggered the next run. And as you can see, the next run is triggered here. So how many uh, records is counted from the source, from the target table? 106, that's the true. Let's see inside this dimension table. Oh, as you can see, here is the new currency. Okay. Uh, let me try to add additional, like, uh, I don't know if uh, this is correct, but yeah, Bitcoin or uh, 
I don't know if this is Ethereum, but yeah, I will save it. So we are waiting for change to be detected here. Okay, looks like it detected some changes. It will trigger the next run, yeah. Now, first task says it's 108 rows, which is correct. So I have transferred my data. Okay, so on this example, we saw how we can uh, use this uh, just to update our dimension table. So maybe it's not the best practice for the data warehouse dimension table, but yeah, uh, this is also one option. So here um, you can also uh, use, uh, you, you, you should keep in mind that uh, we are waiting for the new data and we are checking every 30 seconds. If our data in the source uh, table, source database is not changed that often, maybe we shouldn't do like this. Maybe we should just create uh, one DAG with this load new rows method. And maybe we should execute it every one day. So daily, weekly, monthly, it depends. But if your data is constantly changing or with every five seconds, one minute, few minutes, then this way of creating a DAG is good. Okay, so let's see the last example for today. It's a load currency rate. So, okay, I want to load currency rate, but I don't want to load them all. I want to specify which currencies I want to see inside the currency rate table for which currency we did calculated the rate or uh, uh, what was the average rate. Uh, I can do this with parameters. So when I created a new DAG, I specified parameters here. I have only one, it's called currencies. Uh, the default values are uh, USD and uh, EUR. So the, this is the type array and if this, uh, parameter is optional, I should uh, uh, I should just uh, say that type is also null, not just array. Okay, so I want to specify the array of uh, currencies for which I want to load the data inside this fact table. Also, <clears throat> here inside of this DAG, there is uh, uh, one task, load currency rates. And here, as you can see, I want to use this uh, to read the value from the parameters. So I need it because I want to load data from the source table only for these currencies. So if I didn't specify any currency, that means that I want to load all currency rates. If I specified some currencies, I want to load rates only for them. Okay, after this, I will just uh, <clears throat> read the data from the Postgre uh, dimension table because I need somehow to connect this. If you remember our data warehouse schema for every row inside the fact table, I need to know the exact currency. What is the problem? Uh, inside the data warehouse schema, inside this table, there is an ID <clears throat> that's the new primary key for the currency. So I cannot use the old one. So I need for each currency to find ID, uh, the value of it, to be able to store data inside the fact currency rate uh, table. If you look at the code of the fact, um, oh, okay, uh, sorry, I didn't show the QA. Uh, oh, I'm really sorry, guys, I uh, was looking at the chat. Uh, okay, I will answer it. Uh, I'm finishing with tutorial now and I will answer uh, uh, I will answer all your questions. But yeah, you have all code from here. Okay. 
I'm really sorry. Uh, so let me just finish with this example. <clears throat> so we have some uh, data here, some columns here. And what I'm doing here, let's go inside our code. <clears throat> Um, what I'm doing here, I'm using these parameters values uh, and I'm preparing uh, my pandas data frame to be saved, but I also want to save this in some specific chunk size. Uh, let's uh, imagine that we have a lot of data and we want to do inserts in some chunks. So I specify this as a variable and I read this variable here. And when I want to save this SQL, uh, when, when I want to save this data frame inside the table, I just specify this chunk size that is defined with variable. As you can see, I put here default variable value is 10. If I don't find the variable defined like chunk size, uh, this is the only precaution because uh, we don't want to have any exception here. So if I open the DAG now, <clears throat> Okay, if I open this tag, um, I will unpause it. And as you can see, uh, because I want to trigger it with params, I need to specify them. The default ones are USD and uh, uh, EURR, okay. If I return again, this is the type of task that will be executed when you unpause it. Okay, so uh, here, as you can see, um, everything looks okay. It says it's successfully, it's successfully finished. And if I look at the dimension effect currency rate table, I can see that my data is here and you can only see that there are two currencies here. It's uh, uh, USD and it's EUR. Okay, so this is euro and this is US dollar. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is example how to use variables and how to use uh, parameters. Of course, you can you can define variables here, uh, modify them, and also inside of this deck you can modify your parameters. Maybe we should run for some other. Uh, currency maybe it should be Canadian. Okay. Add trigger. Okay. Let's see. Currency it's Canadian dollar. And here, if I refresh fact currency rate, you will notice, yeah, new records here for Canadian dollar. Okay. So guys, this is the last example for today. I will leave these 10 minutes for uh, questions and also first to answer these questions from the from the uh, Q&A. Uh, so here are the references you can use. Uh, the documentation is really, really good. Of course, the whole project is already on the GitHub. You can use it, you can play around, okay? And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so now I will try to answer your questions. So the first one is, how is it better than Windows Scheduler? So uh, <clears throat> actually, if you uh, <clears throat> if you want to create uh, your your uh, ETL processes with code. And if you want to stay in the same framework, it's much better. You don't have to use then again, Windows scheduler or any other kind. You have everything inside the Apache Airflow. Okay, so it's much easier to specify everything uh, as a code. So to specify schedule interval, to specify a start date. So it, it might be easier. So when you are typing your code, uh, your transformation, your uh, <clears throat> ETL processes or anything else, you just specify scheduling here. So I said if you already have some scripts that are um, that are um, yeah that are already created, you can use uh, Airflow to just to schedule their execution. 
uh okay i hope that i gave the correct uh correct answer uh, so i will stop sharing i don't want maybe uh, answer live what is answer live okay i have done it okay the next question if we need multiple workers uh do we specify them here? Aha, uh -huh. you had a question previously. Yeah, you should specify your work inside the Docker Compose if you want multiple multiple of them. Uh, but in, uh, when you have only one PC, uh, you are doing this with Docker to sim simulate uh, multiple workers. So you can specify them inside the Docker Compose of Airflow. Yeah, it's here. So we had a worker. Okay, you would specify worker one, worker two, etc. Okay, I hope uh, that this answer is appropriate. <clears throat> okay, what would be behavior of sensor if someone do truncate on currency source table or, for example, just to do update for any field? Should we define other sensor code to work on this section? Okay. That's the good good question. I forgot to mention this. Um, for your uh, sensor, you have, you don't have, but you can specify your success criteria or failure criteria uh, functions. So uh, if you want to update rules, uh, then you need to um, specify somehow to detect the difference. So you are just detecting difference with your SQL query, perhaps, with uh, Python code here. OK, so uh, you can then define, uh, is your uh, sensor task uh, executed successfully? But uh, you can do it everything with SQL, I think. So if you compare some values from the source or target table and you detect any difference, that this means that your um, task should be uh, executed. OK, that this should trigger the run of the task. This means that you need to uh, write something in success criteria that fits your needs. So if you are returning one, if something is updated, you would say, OK, if record is one, then OK, return record or something like that. Uh, maybe even a failure criteria. OK, so you can use these things for that. OK. So yeah, it will detect changes based on your code, how you define that with this. And that's it. Okay. If you have anything additional, please ask. Can you please send us you uh huh, you have this inside the code? Yeah, definitely. You have it on the GitHub. So where is the GitHub here? Yeah, airflow, uh, dex, yeah, sense. Okay. Can you please share the presentation, Pia? Uh, yeah, it's already shared with. Uh, it's already shared with panelists. So, uh, I think that uh, tech support should share this with you. Okay, so uh, maybe I can also uh, give you this. And... Okay. Uh, here. Okay, I send it as an answer. Do you have experience in creating an airflow connection for an Oracle with an older version? Okay, 11 GR client. It's not support, uh-huh. Ah, okay, so uh, as you can see on my previous slides, uh, you saw uh, that uh, with airflow, uh, it's, uh, for airflow meta store, it's not supported uh, Oracle DB at all. So you need to use only uh, PostgreSQL, MySQL, SQLite, 
and the Microsoft SQL in some experimental editions, but it's deprecated. So you cannot use. Okay. So if you have additional additional questions, please. Are environment variables encrypted and safe for credential storing? Ah, uh, okay, that's a good question. So as you can see here, <clears throat> uh, when I go to the connections, I specified inside um, my script uh, password for uh, database connection. As, as you can see, there is no field password, meaning uh, that you cannot see, but here you have is encrypted, is extra encrypted. So in our case, it is not, but you can encrypt your uh, environment variables for connections. Uh, what is concerned for the variables, uh, you can also encrypt your environment variable. So yeah, the answer in short is yes, you can, uh, you can encrypt it. Okay, is it a good practice to use Pandas data frames? Because this is going to be very intensive for a, uh, yeah, mesh with data types. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. <clears throat> okay, okay. So uh, it's not so good to use Pandas data frame. Yeah, you're right. If you are uh, dealing with large amount of data, it's not. Then what should we use? Um, we need somehow to transfer our data from one source to another. So uh, we can uh, read it from the source with cursors, okay? And one by one or in some uh, batches, uh, we can transfer it to the target database. So you can just load a few rows and then transfer it to the database. What you can do also, you can uh, do load inside the row schema. That's the reason why I left row schema. And then you can define your SQL code that will have that will satisfy all constraints, data types, etc., to load data from the row schema inside data warehouse schema. So you have multiple options. Okay, so it's not so good to do this via uh, data pandas data frame. Okay, uh, because of things that you mentioned, but it's one of the possible solutions. So you need to see what's the best for your case. Okay, if it's not doing well with Pandas data frame, then you should find something else. Then maybe you can just transfer data uh, row by row inside the uh, row schema, inside the row zone, in target database, and then you will uh, perform some transformation and loading it from the row zone inside the data warehouse zone. So that's the one possible case. Uh, also, you can use uh, any other uh, drivers or uh, tools that are able to connect to the database from Python. So it doesn't you doesn't have to store your data into Pandas data frame. You can find anything else. Okay. So I think that I answered also this question. Do you have any additional questions or um, should I explain something again? We don't have much time now. It's almost the end of the tutorial, but we can discuss this in person if you are at conference. Okay. If there are no additional questions, I'm done. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Miroslav. It was very interesting. And thank you, everyone, for watching the tutorial.